and that helps us out when we switch into word problems. Now again, remember the first step of a word problem is don't panic, okay? You know it's gonna be like the stuff you were just covering, so we probably might, we'll probably get to use our matrices. We're gonna involve more than one variable in most of these, but we just need to read it out, not panicking, and line out our thoughts. Sometimes it helps to draw a picture, you know, just organize your thoughts in whatever way. So at Max's Munchie, he's selling two different snacks, caramel corn and honey roasted mixed nuts. Um, they have different prices. Somebody's coming in for a mix of the two and they wanted to average out at 450 per pound. So we have two different things we're thinking about. We of course have the two snacks, but of the snacks, we're thinking about both their weight and their value, the cost to buy them. So we're gonna assign some variables. So after our step of not panicking and after our step of reading, I need to assign the variables. Don't skim past this part because you'll get deep into the problem, find the answer, but then not remember which one was X. So don't do that. So right there at the very beginning, even if it's an abbreviated form, tell yourself which is which. I'm gonna let X be the caramel corn and Y be the honey roasted mixed nuts. You can use whatever letters you want, but make sure somewhere up at the top, you tell yourself what is what. Now in this one, we're gonna end up with some matrices. Okay, I know this of course, because I've worked this a few times, but watch as we go, kind of how I organize things down here. So like I said, we've got money and we've got weight. We know in the end, they're hoping to make a 20 pound mixture. So that's gonna be 20 pounds total where some of it is caramel corn and some of it is honey roasted mixed nuts. So let's let X not just be the caramel corn, but the caramel corn's weight. Okay, so the pounds of caramel corn. Okay. So, if I wanted to walk out of that store with a 20 pound bag, then that means some of it of X and some of it of Y put together should make 20 pounds total. Next the question is how much did I spend? So it said that they were gonna charge me $2.50 for each one of those pounds of caramel corn. Well, if I bought one pound, I'd have a bill of 250. If I bought two pounds, I'd have a bill of $5. Three pounds would be $7.50. Each time I buy another pound, I add on another $2.50, or I could take the pounds that I bought times $2.50. So that means each time I bought one more pound, I would get charged another $2.50. So the amount of pounds of X times $2.50. The honey roasted mixed nuts were more pricey. They charged me $7.50 for each pound of honey roasted mixed nuts. Now be careful, there's a trick in this one. I'm not walking out of that store with a $4.50 bill. I wanted 20 pounds that averaged $4.50 per pound. So that means my total bill is gonna be not 450, but 20 times 450. So that means my total bill is gonna be $90. Okay, we'll look right here. It's already in our nice matrices form, but I'm gonna have kind of a box of neatness over here to the side. Once I've kind of scribbled down some notes and jotted down my thoughts and organized things, I was pretty organized because like I said, I've done this problem, but you might've needed to scribble a few more little pieces of information, that's fine. Get as messy as you need, but leave yourself a little box of neatness where you can come put the important stuff in the end. So I've got that the X plus Y is 20. I've got that the, let's just shorten this to 2.5 X and 7.5 Y equals 90. 90 because 20 times 450. Now I can put that in that matrices form just like we practiced, 1, 1, 20. Don't worry, it works with decimals just as well. 2.5, 7.5, 90. Punch that in, do your math enter, enter. Actually, you won't even have to do that. It'll be integers. Do your rear roof. And 
and it should give you a matrix that looks like this. Where you have 12 and 8. Double check. Yep. Mm -hmm. So here's where, like I was saying, if we didn't label things, it could be very confusing. So this tells me that the X was the 12, which means that the caramel corn would have been 12 pounds. So right here, I've bought 12 pounds of caramel corn and eight pounds of honey roasted mixed nuts. And I could double check things. So of course, 12 pounds plus eight pounds would make 20. And I could go figure out my bill real quick by 12 times 250, eight times 750, make sure I have a total bill of 90. So you can see how easy it would have been to get the two flip-flop to be confused if I hadn't labeled things up here at the beginning. Okay, here's another one. It seems like it's completely different, but it's really the same problem. Here we've got some drinks and they're telling us different things about them. We've got servings of drinks, but then it does go back and tell us that all of those servings have the same ounces. Since they're all the same, I don't really need to figure that in. It's just an extra number to kind of try to throw us. So instead, really, we're dealing with the servings of the drinks and the amount of caffeine. So it says if we have one serving of each, coffee, energy drink, and soda, we have a total amount of caffeine. Let's set some variables. If I let X be the coffee, Y be a serving of energy drink, we'll abbreviate here, and then Z be a serving of soda. Then this statement right here said if I had one coffee and one energy drink and one soda, I would have had 201 milligrams of caffeine and I would be pretty shaky. Probably shouldn't do that. Okay, here's my next bit of information. One serving of coffee has seven milligrams more caffeine than two servings of soda. Don't panic, we got this. One serving of coffee, coffee was X, has, is, equals, seven more than two sodas. So if a soda had one milligram, then the coffee would have nine. Okay, seven more than two of these. Okay, last it says that one serving of energy drink has 35 less than, here's that sneaky word I always said to watch out for, 35 less than a coffee and a soda. Okay, let's take it step at a time. One energy drink, Y, has, contains, is, equals, one energy drink equals 35 less than, means 35's in the back, backwards. 35 less than one coffee, one soda. One coffee, one soda. Okay, now I've pieced together my information. And somewhere off to the side, my box of neatness, let's organize our thoughts. Okay, this one's already a nice, neat form I can use for my matrices. But these are a bit jumbled together. For it to work for the matrices, they all have to be nice and neat and organized, just like this, right? All my X's together, Y's together, Z's together, equals the numbers. So I'm gonna have to do a little bit of rearranging. So back down here, I've got my variables on both sides. I'm gonna to try to scoot those around. So this one I'm going to subtract the 2z so that I can have them together. So this statement would be the same as x minus 2z is equal to seven. So I'm gonna put that in my matrix form. Notice that I don't have a y, so there'd basically be a zero there. Last, they're all mixed together again, so I'm going to have to rearrange some things. I could go either direction. 
I personally would move my X and Z over like this. So that would rewrite this statement to be, I'm going to put them in order, negative X plus Y minus Z equals negative 35. Careful not to lose that negative there. Okay. Now everything's nice and neat and lined up. So now I can use my matrices. So I can put it in the matrix form. I've got one, 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 two, oh, one. I've got one, zero, negative two, and seven. I've got negative one, one, negative one, negative 35. And then I'll go in and do that rough, and it will spit out a nice pretty matrix that will look like this. Okay, my numbers real quick. And we'll have an 81, an 83, and a 37. So again, this is why it's so important to label them in the beginning. This one was my X, which was the coffee. This one was the Y, which was the energy drink. And then this one was the soda. So I'm curious how true this is. I wouldn't have thought that coffee would be that close to the level of caffeine in an energy drink. So I wonder if they just use these numbers for a problem or if that's true. Okay, this next one, I've got a rectangle. Hopefully you guys remember what those look like. The kind of longish square. So it says that the length of a rectangle is two meters less than three times the width lengths and widths, and it says the perimeter is 20 meters. So some refresher on words, remember perimeter is all four sides going around the edges like you were building a fence. So if I said that this was the width and this was the length, and to find the total perimeter, I would need to add all four of those together, width plus length plus width plus length, which is generally written in the form two lengths and two widths. I would end up with two of each of them. Now this first statement here is written just like that energy drink one. So it says the length of a rectangle is equals two less than, it's their favorite trick, watch out, it means it's at the back, three times the width. There you go. Just always watch for than, from and than. Next it says the perimeter is 20. Well, that means that 2L plus 2W equals 20. Okay, now I could use my matrices. I could do substitution. This one actually wouldn't be too bad to do substitution because this is already solved for L. So if you're pretty comfortable with your algebra, that actually might be quicker than punching all the buttons on the calculator. So just know that that's an option. If you did want to do your matrix just to practice, remember to subtract your 3w over. So that means you would have 1l, but then you would minus 3w equals to negative 2. And then you would have two lengths and two widths equal to 20. So you have that option. Like I was saying, if you did want to substitute, we could do it that way and say that 2l plus 2w equals 20. Let's just work through that real quick so we have a little bit of practice in. So we replace the L with that 3w minus 2. Distribute. Combine our like terms. And then solve for w. And then 24 divided by 8 luckily gives us a nice pretty 3. I'll 
always keep an eye on the problem. Make sure you are fully answering it. In this problem, it asked us to find the width only. So we're done. It could have asked us to find the length as well. If it did, I could have solved it by putting that width that I just found back into my length formula, which would have given me 24 minus two would be 22. Theoretically, they could have asked me to find the perimeter, in which case I would have done my two lengths plus my two widths to see what the full perimeter would be. So even though you have a number, you circled it, just be careful that you did fully answer their question. This one looks like it might be the same. I've got another shape one. It tells me I've got a garden that's a square, but I had some critters eating my stuff, so I made a fence and I put a nice pretty sidewalk on my fence, between my fence and my garden, so I could get around and do all my garden stuff. So I ended up building two fences, once around the garden and once around my nice pretty sidewalk. So I ended up with these two squares. It says that the garden itself, the inside, was a square with a perimeter of 60, so all the way around was 60. And then it says, I built my fence with a three foot walking path. Okay, so if this square had all the same sides, of course, was 60 all the way around with those four sides, then any one of those sides must have been 15 because 60 divided by four is 15, four sides. Well, if I put a three foot sidewalk on it, then this one would be, careful, not 18. So I needed a sidewalk here and a sidewalk here. It's so not 18, but 21. So the full length of this fence would be 21. And of course, it's another square. So it asked me about that fencing. It says I need to build both of the fences and the cost of the fencing was this right here. So first off, let's just see how much fencing I would need. So of course I have the four sides of the smaller fence, which we already knew from the problem was 60. But I also needed to build my bigger fence with a side of 21, which would give me 84, which means I would need a total of 144 feet of fencing. I'm not quite done because I needed to pay for that. So if each one of those 144 feet of fencing cost me $1.14, then my total bill at the end of the day would be, on the page, $164.16. So this one, we didn't need the matrices at all. There wasn't really any substitution. We just kind of reasoned through it. So even when it seemed like they'd be just the same, it ended up being quite different. Got to think through it, remembering to not panic. Here we've got a triangle, new shape, don't panic, you know this. He's that guy with the three sides. It even specifies that it is a right triangle. So remember, that's the one that forms a right angle. It says that lengths of the three sides are given by three consecutive integers. So this is a fancy word for one after the other. So like if I had 67, the next one would be 68, and the next one would be 69, one after the other. So I know that whatever these are, they're one after the other, but I don't know where they start. But since I know they're one after the other, I'm gonna pick the smallest side to start with. Let me draw it a little bit more distinct just so we can tell that it's smaller. It's a right triangle. So if I said he's the smallest, I'm gonna make him X, okay? Because I want to. Then the next one is the next consecutive integer. So he is one higher. So one higher than any random number would be one higher. So if this had been 67, 67 plus one is 68, one higher. The next one is one higher than that. And of course, one plus one is two. So my three sides would be x, x plus one, and x plus two, three consecutive integers. Now it wants me to find the lengths of the sides. It doesn't seem like I have enough information. Here's the key, it was a right triangle. 
there was a special formula that handled the sides of a right triangle. It had to do with that guy, Pythagoras. So he told us that he did a whole bunch of homework and found the pattern that said that a squared plus b squared always ended up being equal to c squared. So that meant the sum of the squares of the two shorter sides was always equal to the square of the longer side. So where this would be an A and a B, interchangeable as long as they're the shorter, and C was always the longest one across from the right angle. So if we said that one shorter side was X and one shorter side was X plus one, and the longest side was the X plus two, then we're halfway there. Be careful not to make that kitten killing mistake. It's not X squared plus four, you've got a foil. So remember that this is really x plus one and x plus one. And this one is really x plus two and x plus two. You've got to foil it. It's not just x squared plus four. Okay, so it's a little bit longer than we might have liked, but it's all right, we'll make it through. Okay, so then that would give me an x squared plus x plus x plus one. Be careful, it's tempting to say two. 1 times 1 is 1. x squared plus 2x plus 2x plus 4. Okay, so I can clean things up, combine my like terms, but also I'm seeing that I have some quadratics. Remember the easiest way to solve a quadratic was to use that quad program by getting it equal to 0. So to get it to be equal to 0, I would want to move everything to one side. I could go either direction, but I like to go to the left. So I cancel these out by putting them over here. To get that, x squared minus 2x minus 3 is equal to 0. 1 minus 4 was 3, 2 minus 4 was negative 2. Now I can use that quad program. As always, it is going to give me the two answers because it's always two. But once I find those two answers, you'll see that something's fishy about one of them. So I punch it in with my a of 1, my b of negative 2, my c of negative 3. It tells me that the x's could either be 3 or negative 1. But remember, like I was saying, always make sure you've answered the question. These were the lengths of a triangle. So I probably can't find a triangle that has a length of negative one. So he's out. So this is the only one that really makes sense. I'm not quite done. I found that X is three. So that means that the next bigger side would have been the four. And last, the longest side would have been a five. Three consecutive integers. Okay, just a little bit more. Let's try this one with some bicycles. So I know it kind of seems like the two train problem, but don't worry, it's not as bad. We have these cyclists, we deal with their distance and their speed. So keep in mind that rate times time equals distance. Okay, they leave from an intersection at the same time. One travels due north, one travels due east. Okay, the guy going north is going 18, the guy going east is 24, a little bit faster. They go for the same amount of time, and then it wants to know at what point is the distance between them as the crow flies 180 miles. So be careful, we have two different units going on here. This is a distance, these two are speeds. So since they are speeds, they are rates. 24 and the 18 are a rate. The 180 is a distance. I have to be careful. But I can connect the two with the variable of time. In fact, that's really what they're asking me about. How long? What is the time? So if I name my variable of time t, because it's a classic, then rate times time equals distance. 
if he was going 24 miles an hour and he traveled for one hour, he would have gone 24 miles. If he traveled for two hours, he would have gone 48 miles. This guy up here was going 18 miles an hour. So multiply that times however long he traveled and we'd see his distance. So rate times time is distance, rate times time is distance. This one was already distance. Now they match, they're all distances. So now I have another right triangle. It's really the same as the last problem. So the two shorter sides, a squared plus b squared equals the longer side, 180 squared. And be careful, he didn't have the t, he was a distance, not a rate. So these numbers get a little big, but don't worry, we've got our calculator to take care of it. So this turns into 324 t squared. This one is 576 t squared. And this one is 32,400. When I add those up, it's getting a little prettier. It becomes 900. And here I have those options just like a few lessons ago. I could get it equal to zero and use quad. I could use my square root principle and see if I could do my plus or minus, whichever way you prefer. It's kind of tempting just to try to isolate the variable. Most people end up doing that, which does give me 36. Just be careful in that last step because when I square root both sides, technically there's a plus or minus. So t could equal 6 or t could equal negative 6. But unless Marty McFly is on one of those bicycles, probably the answer for this problem is going to be that positive 6. So mathematically, negative 6 would work. But in the context of the problem, the answer of 6 is the only possible answer. So this one is out. All right, one more in this section. I know this one's a bit long. We've got an inheritance. This would be a nice problem to have, right? How to split up your $15,000. So he's got these options in the money market, municipal bonds and mutual funds. And he's got interest involved, of course, and just some statements about how things compared. So let's name our variables. We've got the money market. Let's call him X. And the money market is earning 4% just to organize our thoughts. We've got Y, the municipal bonds, and it says they are earning 5%. And then last, it's got the mutual fund, and it's earning 6%. Why do not just throw it all in the 6%? I don't know, diversification, something. We'll have to talk to a lawyer, right? Okay, so let's just do the math instead. So he's got 15,000 to split up total. So if X is the money in the money market, so this is how much he's putting here, how much he's putting there, how much he's putting there, then 15,000 is the total money of all three accounts. That means that sum of X, sum of Y, and sum of Z should total 15,000. Okay. It says one year later, he gets a check for $730 in interest from these accounts. Well, remember the interest was earned, but these with these rates based on the amounts he put in. So for example, if he put $100 into the money market at 4%, he would get a check for $4 because $100 times 4% as a decimal equals $100. Sorry, would equal $4. So that means I could figure the interest on any amount in the money market by multiplying it by 4% as a decimal. Same thing for the bonds. And same thing for the mutual funds as a decimal. At the end of the year, all three of those together gave him a check of $730. That would be nice. Last, it says there was $2,000 $2, more invested in the mutual funds than there was in the bonds. So, seems tricky. Think this through. 
Which one is bigger? 2,000 more in the funds than the bonds. 2,000 more in the funds than the bonds. So the funds is bigger, right? Okay, keep that in mind because it'd be easy to flip it the way it's worded. But you know, if you read that, that this one is bigger. So that means if the funds is bigger, Z is bigger, then you would have to take the smaller one, the bonds, and add more to it. How much more? 2,000 more. Okay, there's 2,000 more in the funds. The funds is bigger, Z is bigger. 2,000 more than what? 2,000 more than the bonds, why? So it'd be really easy to flip this just the way it's worded. So just think through this fact right here. Now, if I wanted to solve this with matrix, which I would highly recommend, remember I need to get the numbers together and all the letters together. So I'd move this Y over here and line it all up nice and neat so that I can use my matrices. Okay, so here's my box of neatness. So even though I was kind of thinking through things over here, my box of neatness where it's all ready for my matrix, kind of somewhere off to the side. So then I'd have one, 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 15,000. I would have those decimals, 0 0.04, 0.05, and 0 0.06, equal to that 730. And then last, be careful to zero for the X. There weren't any money markets involved in that last statement. Minus one positive one, 2,000. Punch that in, do your roof, and it should give you this right here. Oops, sorry, got distracted. where we had 7,000 to make all this work out in the money market, 3,000 in the bonds, and 5,000 in the mutual funds. And now remember, you can take a second and check this work. So when you're on a test, don't just circle and put it, you know, move on. If you have some time before your, your test is done, check your work. If I added these together, I get 15,000. At least do that, super fast, super easy. And then I could double check things. 5,000 is 2,000 higher than this one. Okay, the mutual funds were 2,000 more than the bonds. And I could even figure out my interest on all of these. So just be careful, don't move on too fast. The money markets, the municipal bonds, and the mutual funds. Okay. Also, in word problems, as you've seen in these examples, they tend to come up with pretty answers, pretty numbers. So if you're getting something like 6782.933333, double check your work. While it is a possible number, it is a possible value, most of the time they create the word problems to give you pretty answers. Not guaranteed, but most of the time. So just double check things if your answers are getting weird. That is all for lesson four. I know that's a long one, but it's worthwhile. Okay, so just try to take it slow, step at a time. Don't panic. You got this. Thanks for watching.